Okay, so we should be recording now. So um, for those that you haven't figured out yet, I, some of the lectures that I've managed to not mess up the recording are um, there's kind of really low quality sound recordings that are available on Learn. So if you want to go back through that for revision, please use that. And also, uh, I've posted another question on the discussion forum, which should help you kind of like uh, further understand the lecture material, but also um, I have given you the right hand out. Um, should help you understand the material, but should also help with revision. Um, and I see the take up so far on that discussion forum has been extremely, extremely low. Um, so, uh, which, you know, I mean, it's less work for me because I don't have to respond to all of your questions. Um, also, uh, office hours, there was the, the Monday, 9 o'clock, 1. That's the most convenient time for the three people uh, that responded to that survey. So um, if you don't like the office hours being at 9 o'clock, you should have responded to the um, thing. Anyway, we move on. Um, so just to point out, this is what I've just said with that movie. Um, so this is the concentration of salt in the surface ocean. And that map of concentration will be the same for all conservative elements. Okay. Things to point out here is the scale goes from 30, uh, 31 parts per thousand up to uh, 39 parts per thousand. It doesn't go to zero okay, because the salt never gets used up by the removal processes because it's got such a long residence time in the ocean. Now if we look at uh, what life does in the ocean, so this, this, this diagram on the... Um, your left? Your right, your right, your right. The diagram on the right is a map of, 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 of chlorophyll concentration in the surface ocean. So this is measured by a satellite. Look down and have a look at the colour of the ocean from what they can work out what, uh, what, how much life is going on. And you can see there that the pattern of where life happens is not the same as the pattern of where the salt is. Okay? So although there are elements that make up salt, so, for instance, potassium and maybe calcium are important for life. So, life couldn't exist without those uh, without those elements. They're not limiting where the life can happen. Okay. So, today's lecture will be about those elements that do matter. Okay. The elements that determine where life can happen. Okay. In the ocean, which is important if you like um, fish or or of the other things that uh, life in the ocean does, like sequester carbon dioxide and all kinds of goody things. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, this is basically on the, on the left, your left, on your left, uh, is that same salinity map, just on a, on a round um, thing. Uh, and the, on the, now looking at the nitrate concentration. So nitrate is one of the major nutrients in the ocean. And you can see that has a very different kind of concentration distribution. So over most of the ocean, the concentration is very, very low. Okay? So you can see the scale of the nitrate goes down to zero, and over most of the ocean, the concentration is very close to zero. Okay? So, and there are, there are only a few places where there are significant concentrations of nutrients in the ocean. And this is a problem for life, because life needs those nutrients, needs, needs nitrate to do its thing. Okay? So we're going to discuss how, how it gets those and what not and so forth. So, um, so just I guess these are the, some of the sort of the major nutrients that life really needs to to get you know, get its thing on in the ocean. So really the major two nutrients are phosphorus and nitrogen. So, so in, the, in the form of phosphate and nitrate are the key nutrients that life needs. Okay, some life in the ocean needs silicon, but not so much. Okay, um, so the concentrations of these are typically very very low. I think they're usually measured in I think parts per million. So that's a measure of mass per mass. So parts per million is a very small amount. Or uh, chemists among you might be more familiar with the term molar in terms of the concentration of something. So we're looking into uh, micromolar concentrations. So very, very low concentrations in the ocean, but critical for the life that, that goes on and on off. And they typically have very short residence times. Okay, they must have short residence times, otherwise their concentration distribution would be the same as salt. Okay? So they have short residence times, and that's because they're constantly being removed by life. Okay? Life uses up these nutrients and removes them from the ocean. And that le high rate of removal leads to a short residence time. Okay, so this is kind of just a little diagram showing why these kind of things are important. So if these are, we're just looking at a look at nitrogen and phosphates, or nitrogen and phosphate, or nitrogen and phosphate. NNP, whatever, doesn't really matter. Um, so they're essential for kind of all kinds of biomolecules. So uh, DNA, 
Uh, you might be able to make it out on your, you probably can't make it out here, but make it out on your diagram. So it's round, full of nitrogen, okay? The amino in amino acid means kind of nitrogen. So this chain is made up of amino acids. Um, so without nitrogen, life can't make DNA. Similarly, cell walls, okay, are essential for anything that has made of cells, which is kind of everything that lives. Uh, cell walls are made of these molecules, the long carbon change with the green thing on there is a phosphate group. Okay, so for every kind of like cell wall, you need lots and lots of phosphorus. Okay, so these are essential things that uh, life needs. Okay, so so we're going to talk a little bit now about what how we're going to simplify life a little bit. So many of you, or some, maybe biologists, uh, will be horrified to see this reaction written like this. Um, but so this is this is not a chemical reaction. Okay, so this is basically the end products. This summarizes what photosynthesis does. Okay, so photosynthesis takes water, okay, splits it up um, to make oxygen, and then uh, uses that hydrogen ion um, to sequester CO2 to form organic matter and produce oxygen. Okay? So it's not, I mean it's not, it's not that simple. Okay, so but if we think there are these other things that, that life needs to do that photosynthesis. It needs not just CO2, but nitrate, phosphate, loads of water, it needs some of the sun's energy, and that ends up forming organic matter that includes some of these nitrogen and phosphorus species. Okay? So this is kind of like the composition of organic matter down the bottom that's made up of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. That kind of is a pretty good description of what life or biogoo is. Release some oxygen. Okay, so once again, this is not this is not a reaction. Okay, this reaction doesn't go backwards and forwards for starters. So you can't. I mean, um, so photosynthesis and decomposition or respiration are two very separate processes. Okay, and also, I mean, you don't when you respire stuff, you don't give out sunlight. Okay, so but it's, it's written. I've written it like this just to give a um, basically to summarise what happens when life or, or photosynthesizers produce organic matter from inorganic nutrients, so carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Okay, I should probably point out, yeah, so obviously, so it's not a backwards and forwards reaction, okay? It's like you have photosynthesis, and then something else does respiration. And of course, um, so it, it's more like this, really. So photosynthesis, one kind of process, decomposition is another, but it basically, you start out with inorganic, um, I shall use the little thing. Inorganic stuff, uh, carbon dioxide, nitrate, and phosphate, and you produce organic matter that includes basically organic forms of nitrogen and phosphate. Okay, so this is basically bio goo here. Okay, I guess once again, for those, I think, okay, you don't really need to know these reactions for this course, but just to show that I actually do know what photosynthesis is. Okay, so photosynthesis is basically a little bit more complicated than that simple kind of reaction. These are actual reactions that happen during photosynthesis. So where um, water and these kind of like energy transforming molecules, NADP and ADP, and phosphate, okay, take water and split it into hydrogen ions and oxygen. There's a separate reaction that doesn't need light that sequesters CO2 into organic matter. And those Again, those. Um, okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, so those 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 molecules that are essential for those photosynthesis reactions. Again, so this is the uh, uh, this is ADP and ATP at the top, and this is this NADP plus. And I think if you if you switch onto the next slide, which you can see the difference. Oh, it's so different. Um, they've just added a hydrogen onto that. But if you look at what those molecules are made of. They have these uh, groups, functional groups that are phosphates, or one's this weird sounding thingy here, but that's got nitrogen in it. So they are essential elements for photosynthesis to do its thing. Okay, and photosynthesis is basically the most important uh, chemical thing that goes on on Earth. So nitrogen and phosphate are therefore the most important um, uh, chemical species in the ocean, other than maybe carbon. I guess water, which I guess is probably quite important to have in the ocean. Um, okay, so that's those reactions again. Why is this going?
Okay, so, um, so how does this play out in the ocean? Okay, so we get uh, nutrients, so nitrates and phosphate are added to the surface ocean. So you remember from the first lecture that I did with the water and the red stuff, yeah? That the, there was a, basically a warm layer that formed on the top of the ocean or little glass, okay? And that's kind of isolated from the, the deep ocean. So we have a, a warm layer that's near the surface where plants, so phytoplankton, can take these nutrients and they can make uh, organic matter out of them. Okay, so that, that, that organic matter then either gets eaten by something or sinks on its own accord into the deep ocean. Okay, when it gets into the deep ocean, there's no light going on, so it can't make any more kind of organic matter. So that, that material gradually gets respired by bacteria, mostly, and releases those nutrients back out into the water. Okay? Also releases CO2 back out into the water. So that this 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 process basically transports um, nutrients and carbon from the surface ocean into the deep ocean. Okay, and this is a, a slightly more um, diagrammatic chemistry type thing of doing that. So that what we've got at the top there is that that kind of reaction that's not a reaction, but that summary chemical process that takes carbon dioxide, nitrate, phosphate, water, it takes that and it does photosynthesis, does photosynthesis and produces organic matter that contains carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And then that works its way through the food web, which exports those, those chemical elements down into the deep ocean. Okay, so this does explain why at the beginning that's that map of nitrate in the, which has very low concentrations in the surface, Okay, the, the reason for that was because any nutrients that make it up into the surface ocean get used up and exported into the deep ocean. Okay. Okay, it's not so. It's not. Uh, it's not just the organic matter. So quite a lot of the things that live in the ocean uh, uh, have shells. Hi, come in. Say hello. Uh, there's some stuff there. If you want to get some stuff? Yeah. Um, so uh, things that live in the ocean quite often have shells or skeletons, so either made of, so this is some kind of you saw thing at the top, that would have uh, a hydroxyapatite skeleton. Yeah, that's probably not a new thing. Um, these are coccolithophores, so these are kind of like phytoplankton. They have calcareous um, skeletons or coccoliths, as so they're called, these little plates. And this is a, a coral. Coral is made of calcium carbonates. That produces stuff from the ocean. And, and this is a crown of thorns starfish, which is also made of a calcium carbonate. So it's not calcium, but so this is uh, the, an acantharia, basically, which is a uh, type of plankton, which makes its shell out of strontium carbonate. And these things over on the on the um, right are um, silica producing. So these are little plankton. So these are diatoms here, radiolaria at the top. This is a, a benthic sponge. They grow their shells or skeletons out of um, silica. So when these things grow, they also remove those elements out of the ocean. Okay, so this is another schematic diagram, which you should have. Um, so this is when things grow their shells, they remove calcium, silicon, strontium. They remove that out of the surface ocean, okay, and export it down to the deep ocean. Now these elements are conservative. Okay? So although there is a flux from the surface ocean to the deep ocean, this flux is very small relative to the concentration or the stock of stuff in the ocean. Just budge people along. Just... Go on. Be aggressive. Go on. Um, um, so, that, so we don't really see depletions of these elements in the surface ocean. There are very, very small changes, but you need um, uh, very, very accurate measurements to, to resolve those. But they do have an impact on the climate system, because when these things uh, form their shells, the process of forming the shells also has an impact on things like the carbon cycle. So if you look at the very top reaction there, when you form a calcium carbonate shell, you take calcium, you take HCO3-, minus, which is bicarbonate, and you form calcium carbonate, <coughs> you also release CO2. Okay, so it has an impact on the carbon cycle, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture, which will be later in the week, can't remember when. But, um, so come to that lecture, it'll be awesome. Okay, so we're gonna talk about now about 
the proportions at which these nutrients are used. So there's this. So you might have noticed that these um, reactions that are not reactions that I had up uh, have these numbers in basically the stoichiometry of the process of photosynthesis has 106 CO2s, 16 nitrogens, and one phosphorus. Okay, plus loads of water make um, the organic matter and 138 oxygens. Okay, there is a reason why those numbers are they are. I mean, if you try to actually balance that reaction without any prior knowledge, you wouldn't come up with those numbers. Okay? But it turns out that everywhere you go in the ocean, the average kind of usage of these nutrients relative to how much carbon they sequester from the CO2 pool is 116, 100, 106, 16 to 1. Now, if you go somewhere else, if you go to land, okay, the relative utilization of nutrients is very different. Okay? Okay? And actually, when you go to the oceans, it's a little bit different. But the average in the ocean is always 106, 16 to 1. Um, and this is actually one of the great puzzles of chemical biological oceanography. We don't really know why. But it, it always is that. So, so this was basically figured out in 1934 by this guy, Alfred Redfield, uh, who uh, is a very famous uh, chemical oceanographer. So uh, he has got a building named after him at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, it's one of the most prestigious oceanographic institutes in the world. Uh, and basically, he observed so a graph like this. So uh, you don't have this graph in your handout, because I only just added it in. Uh, but I do recommend that you sketch it. So you sketch quickly kind of a graph that has phosphorus up here, nitrate across the, the bottom, and then basically a straight line with loads of kind of like sketchy data on it. Okay? And what he found was that you know, anywhere you go in the ocean, okay, so if you go, so he, he went to some, some places, say, say he measured here and found the nitrate nitri to phosphorate ratio was here. Okay? Now then he kind of went back a bit later and saw if any photosynthesis or respiration had gone on, okay? And he found that whenever that was the case, you always, so if, there, if photosynthesis had happened, you'd remove nit nitrogen and phosphorus from the water and you'd take it into the organic material. So the remaining water would go down along this line, okay? If you were just using up nitrogen, okay, without using up phosphate, you would move along like this, okay? But if you look at, this is all of the data for the world it all falls roughly up and down this line, okay? So, I mean, there are a number of things that we don't really understand this, this diagram. We don't really understand why it doesn't go through zero, okay? So when you deplete nu nutrients, you always end up with just a little bit more phosphorus left over than nitrate, so that you always seem to run out of nitrogen before you run out of phosphorus, which is a bit bizarre, because you can actually make nitrogen in the ocean, whereas you can't make phosphorus in the ocean. But nonetheless, this is quite a useful kind of tool uh, for us to, because we can, by, by measuring these different um, uh, nutrients in the ocean, it tells us something about what are the processes that are going on. And we'll come on to this in the practical, uh, either on Wednesday or next Tuesday, depending on uh, what you've um, signed up for. Um, so what do these, Distribution. So we looked at the beginning about the kind of horizontal distribution of nutrients. Okay? If we look now at the vertical distribution of nutrients in the ocean. So in the surface ocean, so this is a so basically a, a graph of this is depth, so this is the surface, and this is the deep ocean. God knows why I put depth in minus kilometers, but yeah. and this is the concentration. So zero concentration here, and then up to some concentration up here. And you notice the concentration of nitrate is approximately 16 times bigger than the concentration of phosphate, okay? Now, in the surface ocean, okay, we, we're having lots of life doing its thing, lots of light, okay, for photosynthesis to happen. So that removes nutrients from the surface ocean. That drives the concentration to almost zero, okay? That phytoplankton gets eaten, made into fish poo, sinks, fish can break apart and gets rep respired, okay? So at about a kilometre depth, Okay, we start to release all those nutrients back into the ocean. Okay? And then in the deep ocean, okay, uh, you should have covered with Simon the concept of deep ocean circulation. 
So the deep ocean, this is water that's been at the surface in the high polar latitudes, okay, where it would have had a very low nutrient concentration because it gets used up by nutrient by life, and then it gets gradually evected through the oceans. Okay? And as it does so, it gradually increases its concentration. Okay. Uh, okay, and this is nitrate and silicate. You see silicate looks slightly different because um, well silicate is not is is formed in the shells of some of these phytoplankton. Okay, so it's respired, it's not respired back, it's basically the, as the shells dissolve. So it's a slightly different process that releases it back into the, the ocean, which is why it's got a slightly different looking profile. Okay, so uh, so this kind of explains some of the, uh, they said the surface concentration. So most of the oceans, we're using up all of the nutrients, okay, very low concentrations. Uh, in the polar regions, you see in the Southern Ocean, in the, in the high northern latitudes, we have some places where, where there were, basically there were nutrients left over. They haven't been completely used up by life. Okay. There are a couple of reasons for this. We'll come to one at the end of the lecture, but one of the most important is that in the polar regions, it's dark a lot of the time. Okay, so for half of the year, it's dark all of the time. Okay? So in some of these polar regions, there are nutrients available, but there's not enough light for those nutrients to be completely used up by, by life. Okay? Um, okay, so okay, so if we look at now, I guess what I showed a, a, a diagram a little bit like this. At the beginning of the um, of the lecture, so these two uh, maps on the <coughs> right are basically the amount of chlorophyll in the surface ocean, how much photosynthesis is going on, and that's being converted into a, a rate of what we call primary productivity. So that's the amount of carbon that's being taken out of the surface ocean and, and, and by photosynthesis. You can see that the distribution of where that's happening is now actually very similar to the distribution of where the nutrients are. Okay, so the distribution of nutrients, at least far away from the polar regions, is playing a really strong control on uh, how much life can um, you know, do its thing. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is about limiting nutrients. I just point out that in most parts of the ocean, we tend to run out of nitrate before we run out of phosphate. Okay, um, but there are some other places where other nutrients, so it's not just, and we'll come on to iron at the end of the, the uh, lecture, but um, if you run out of any kind of critical element, okay, life will not be able to use up those nutrients, won't be able to do its thing, okay? So, um, yeah. Back. Uh, scrubs out all of the duration. Anyway, but on the uh, nitrogen side, there are a whole bunch of processes that go on here. So we've got nitrogen, is mostly in this inert form N2, completely useless to life, uh, and that gets fixed into bioavailable forms, so ammonia and nitrate by processes like lightning or nitrogen fixation in plants by, well, by basically nitrogen fixing bacteria in plants, and um, the ocean has quite a lot of those. Uh, anyway. Okay, so we look at, say, for instance, the um, Arctic. Okay, we look at the the Arctic. There's no nitrogen left, nitrate left in the Arctic. It's all been used up, but uh, there's lots and lots of phosphorus available. Okay, and that's largely because the Arctic has got lots of rivers flowing into it, so it's got lots of supply of phosphate. Okay. Okay, and then there are um, these other zones which supply nutrients. So you might have done, you might, you've done how water upwells from the deep to the shallow in oceanography with Simon. Winds blow, you get divergence either away from water or, or, or either away from the coast or, uh, or places along the equator. And that brings up water from the deep ocean, which has got lots of nutrients into it. So places along the equator, along by Namibia, the Arabian Sea, and basically anywhere along the, the west coast of a large landmass around the equator, you tend to get nutrients brought to the surface. And in these regions, they're highly productive. You get lots of kind of biological activity going on because there's a lot of supply of nutrients. This is, yeah, you, you, you should have covered that. Um, and also this. So this is um, 
and it is basically a close-up showing where deep water is being brought to the surface. Supplying nutrients which can be used by Okay, so if we go back to looking at the deep ocean now. So this is a cartoon kind of sketch of the different ocean basins, okay, and water flows between those at the surface, okay, so that cartoon at the beginning had loads of ocean currents, but also we have deep water formation, so in the Atlantic, um, uh, around the Antarctica, in the um, Weddell Sea, and up here around Greenland, water can sink down to the bottom, so that's the dark, well they're all dark aren't they? Um, the not dashed lines, okay, so that's water that flows along, basically along the bottom of the ocean, or in the interior of the ocean, and then that basically makes it that way down through the Atlantic, and then eventually up into the Indian and Pacific Oceans, okay, where it eventually comes up to the surface, and then makes its way back into the Atlantic. Okay, and if we look at how that affects, what happens to the, the um, nutrients, okay, so what these are, they're basically slices through the ocean at uh, 3,500 3, meters. So quite deep in the ocean, okay? And you can see, if we just look at, uh, it's all kind of one of the, um, let's look at, uh, let's look at, um, yeah, let's look at this one, nitrate, okay? So the water sinks here, goes to the bottom, and because it's come from the surface relatively recently, it's got a low concentration, okay? As that water flows from the North Atlantic into the South Atlantic, okay, it's there, for, that takes a long time, okay? Deep ocean circulation is a very slow process. So as that water is flowing, the surface ocean above it, life is kind of having its little party, doing its thing, and producing lots of organic material that's basically raining down into the deep ocean, okay, and releasing nutrients, okay? So that means that the nutrient, blah, blah, the nutrient concentration for phosphate, nitrate, and silicate <coughs> gradually increases along the flow path of the um, water. Uh, and similarly, as the process that releases those nutrients is respiration, okay, you can look at the oxygen concentration. So as those nutrients are released, they're released by respiration, which is using up oxygen. Okay, and we look at oxygen, so oxygen starts out high concentration and gradually gets used up as the water flows along its flow path into the Indian or into the um, Pacific. Okay? And we'll talk more about oxygen in the next lecture. Okay? But we can see here that basically the, the, the deep ocean is basically picking up all of the nutrients that have been rained out from the surface ocean. That's the, that, those, there, there, that. These are the flow paths of deep water. So you can see along those flow paths we get gradually increasing nutrient uh, concentrations, reducing oxygen concentration. Okay, so this is a section, so we've basically taken a slice vertically from the north, through the North Atlantic now. So uh, from the north over this side, to the south over this side, and we can see that basically that tongue of water, okay, are you familiar with the term North Atlantic deep water? Yeah, okay, so this is North Atlantic deep water in phosphate concentration. So it forms with very low concentrations in the North Atlantic, and as it moves down to the Atlantic, it gradually picks up nutrients from the uh, productivity in the surface waters above. Okay, nitrate, same deal. Oxygen, it's the opposite. So we're using up the oxygen in the water as it flows along the hula dancer thing. Um, okay, so this is basically, if we just look at that really simple, uh, so, should we just call it a summary equation, right? So it's not an actual equation, it's not a re chemical reaction, but it summarizes the process in this case of decomposition. So in this case, we're, we're using up oxygen and we're releasing nitrate and phosphate, okay? So we're releasing nitrate and phosphate in a ratio of 16 to 1. So as we go along the flow, 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 flow path of the water, Okay, the, the, rate, the rate of increase of nitrate should be 16 times the rate of the increase of phosphorus. Okay, remember that for the practical. <laughs> okay, that's oxygen. Okay, silicate, slightly different, and that's because it has a, there's a different process. So silicate is being added to the ocean similarly, so it starts out with a low concentration, as North Atlantic sea water flows to the south, we increase the concentration of silicate, but that's being added by a different process. That's being added by the dissolution of shells, not by respiration of organic matter. 
Okay, so if we look at a little bit more detail now, so this is the, um, the nitrate to phosphate ratio. Okay, so this is the thing that should always be 16 to 1. Okay, so if we actually look in the surface of the top, top left, top left, top left is the uh, nitrate to phosphate ratio in the surface ocean. That's you, that should be 16. Okay, but it's not 16 because one of the nutrients get used up more quickly than the other. So if you actually look at the places which are closest to being um, 16, these are the places which, where we're adding, um, we're adding nutrients <coughs> from the deep ocean. So in places where we've got lots of upwelling, so we have lots of upwelling in the southern ocean, we have upwelling off um, our man here, Namibia, along the equator, Arabian Sea. So we're getting quite close to that 16 value there. So we're adding nutrients to the surface at a near redfield ratio, but um, what's left behind after those nutrients have been removed okay, is not quite at the redfield ratio. But as we go down into the deep ocean, okay, when we start integrating all of that productivity from lots of slightly different regions, okay, uh, the ratio basically comes, becomes more homogeneous. Okay, so as we get down to 1,000 metres, so this is where most of the remineralization or decomposition is going on. Okay, we get almost everywhere has got the same uh, nitrogen to phosphate ratio. Okay, so I've said that we always get this ratio of 15 to 1, 16 to 1, 16 to 1. Um, that's an average, okay? But if you start looking at individual organisms, okay, so an individual culture of um, a specific phytoplankton, for instance, it might have a slightly different kind of ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphate in its, in its organic matter. And that's because kind of organisms are adapted to their environments. So this is an, an, an elephant, it's an organism not particularly well adapted to the cold, but you can see that it's adapted, it's got this nice long trunk here, which is perfectly well adapted to this particular environment of getting water out of a frozen stream. But, but phytoplankton basically have kind of a similar kind of, kind of diversity, or well, probably more diversity than macrofauna, or the fluffies and cuddlies. Um, so if we, we've gone to basically summarize these three different types of phytoplankton. Okay? So there are you know, billions of types of phytoplankton, but if we group them into things that types of phytoplankton that like to basically uh, eking out an existence in these really low nutrient parts of the ocean. Okay, out in the, we call them oligotrophic gyres, so these are the, the regions that have very low nutrient concentrations, so far away from the coast in the middle of the oceans. So they tend to have kind of, make themselves out of basically components that are adapted for, for them to eke out an existence. Okay, so they make, they're very efficient with their use of nutrients. So they have lots of, uh, so they, for instance, they will have um, lots of, lots of pigmenty type molecules because they need to make as much energy, collect as much energy as possible because they need lots of energy to, for instance, to, um, there's, there's a, there's a, there are some phytoplankton that can make uh, nitrate out of nitrogen gas, okay? It's a very energy intensive process. So those tend to have lots and lots of um, uh, these kind of pigmenty protein type molecules. And those molecules don't have a red field ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus. They have much more nitrogen than phosphorus. Whereas some organisms, they tend to live in places where there's loads of nutrients. There's like loads and loads of nutrients like hanging around. So they can, they can reproduce as much as they like. They can get on with life. They can do the things. So they basically, they, they've evolved so that they have uh, the molecules in their body that allow them to reproduce really, really quickly. So they can make most use of the resources available to them. Um, so these are these kind of, these kind of, these dudes here. So some called the bloomer. So they like to just kind of rapidly bloom and have lots and lots of productivity going on. So they have to have lots of kind of uh, DNA, RNA type of molecules that enables them to reproduce really quickly. And those kind of molecules have got a low nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Okay? So if you are um, in a region of the ocean that's got lots of kind of nutrients coming up, so you get more of these bloomer type organisms, okay, then you're going to start exporting, okay, more 
um, phosphorus than nitrogen down into the deep ocean. Okay? Whereas if you're in a kind of environment where it's really nutrient poor, okay, there's not a lot of um, uh, a lot of life going on. But what life does go on is, is mostly made up of these survivalist type planktony things. Um, you're going to start exporting more nitrogen than phosphorus out of the ocean, okay? Which is kind of a double kicker for these organisms because they need nitrogen. Okay, you're removing more of it, which is kind of really annoying. Um, so there is this kind of variability in the exact ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus that's exported out of the surface ocean, okay? And that reflects the kind of environment that has happened in the surface ocean above. Okay? So just by looking at how the nitrates change in the deep ocean, okay, that tells us a little bit about the, the integrated productivity that's happening in the surface ocean, okay? which you shall come on to in the practical um, and whatnot. Okay, so this is kind of like the kind of a little schematic of that. Uh, uh, so in a region where we've got uh, low primary productivity, very nutrient poor, okay, like this. Okay, we have these kind of organisms here, which are very, very <laughs> energy efficient, okay, which means that they've got lots of, um, basically, slightly more nitrogen than uh, phosphate, okay, because they recycle their phosphate very efficiently, um, and they can actually take nitrogen and fix it, okay. And by taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere and into the ocean, you raise the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio above the redfield ratio, and you also preferentially remove the nitrogen into the biological material. Okay? Whereas in a high primary productivity region, okay, where the, the plankton is just going crazy, going reproduce, reproduce, reproduce. Okay? It's like the, the Catholic plankton. Um, <laughs> It's kind of inappropriate, but anyway. Um, so that's that is more phosphorus efficient. Be an interesting experiment. We could anyway. We won't. We will not go down that route. Um, so that that is using uh, phosphorus more than it is nitrogen. So that it will be exporting basically much much below the redfield ratio. But when you average these things out. It turns out that like, the global average tends to still go back to this nitrous to phosphorus ratio, which is weird, right? I mean, why is it like that everywhere? And okay. So, if you want to become a chemical oceanographer, biological oceanographer, these are kind of the questions that you know, are really kind of puzzling lots of people at the moment. You know, can we actually use these elements, these, these nutrient ratios, to tell us about kind of the past or the, even the present ocean and what what biological activity is going on, and what is really limiting biological activity? Okay. If we wanted to stimulate biological activity in the ocean. Which nutrient should we add? Okay, or if there's too much biological activity, say, so if you have something like coastal eutrophication, which we'll come on to in, in further lectures. Okay, which nutrient do we need to worry about? Which is limiting? Okay. Okay, so um, I guess quickly while we're at the end here, so we just talk a little bit about the Southern Ocean here. So the Southern Ocean is a region of the Earth that has lots of primary productivity. Okay, so there's lots of plankton doing their thing over there. Super productive. Okay, you have these huge kind of accumulations of krill that are feeding on plankton, which supply like big whales and whatnot before we kill more. Um, uh, but there's still lots of nutrients in that water, so life is not using up those nutrients as efficiently as it could. Okay, so there's basically something that's running out. Okay, we're either running out of light or we're running out of another nutrient before all those uh, nitrogen phosphate get. Okay, so we can talk a little bit now about trace nutrients. So nitrogen and phosphate, they're I mean, relatively abundant, only in part per million. Okay, so, but, um, but there are also other things that life needs. Okay, so um, you might have had like a vitamin pill when you were you know, worried about your health or whatnot. Um, but it's got all kinds of elements in it, you know, zinc, cadmium, no, not cadmium, but zinc. So cadmium is essential for life, but in very low quantities. Don't, don't go drinking caffeine. But um, so things like selenium, iron, copper, um, potassium, all these, all these kind of elements are essential for life, right? You have them in your sort of snatch and A to Z, whatever it is, okay? So in the ocean, it's the same. So the ocean needs these kind of metal elements, okay? And in actually in much, much lower concentrations of nutrients, so down to nano or picomolar 
which is 10 to the minus lots, okay? So really, really low concentrations, but really essential for life. If you don't have iron, okay, we have, so this is, for instance, how iron gets into the ocean and sort of formates. This is a plume of sediments coming off some islands. Do I have a little molecule? No, I don't. Anyway, so iron is one of these essential nutrients for, um, for life to, to do its thing. Um, and it, it gets into the ocean through a number of different sources. So this is, uh, this is a plume of dust. So basically rocks, got a bit of iron in them. You dump those rocks in the ocean. A little bit of that iron will dissolve out, okay? Uh, most of the iron will make it, will just sink straight to the bottom. It will stay in mineral form, but some of it will go out into the ocean. Okay, so major sources of iron are dust. Okay, you can see here that the equator is quite dusty because it's near the Sahara Desert, but the Southern Ocean, not so dusty. So there's not a, a supply of iron. Okay, you can also add iron through hydrothermal activity. So this is a cross section through, I think, the uh, Southern Ocean. But this, so this is, this is essentially kind of a, a mid-ocean ridge here, okay? So there's lots of volcanoes at the top of that, and they're having their volcanic activity, lots of hydrothermal circulation through the rock, and that releases iron into the water column, okay? So that's the source of iron, but that iron is not in the surf, that's useless for primary productivity, because it's in the deep ocean, okay? So there has to be some process that gets that iron up to the surface, which could be upwelling or mixing. Okay, so this is the... Um, this is that nitrate distribution again. And you can see here that there's this extra nitrate in the, in the Southern Ocean. And the hypothesis is that the reason why the Southern Ocean is not as productive as it could be, okay, there's not as much photosynthesis going on there as you could actually get if you went, you know, uh, turned it up to uh, dial up to 11, is because this region doesn't have enough iron. Okay? There's, there are, there, this, this region is, is, is starved of iron, so photosynthesis does its thing, and then it runs out of this essential micronutrient, okay, and then it can't do any more. Okay, so then the nutrients then just accumulate in the, in the surface ocean. Okay, so I didn't have the little pictures of molecules and whatnot, but to summarise, um, I mean, you've got the summary stuff there. Um, oh, that's what I was going to say. So if you look at your back of your, of your thing, back of the thing, yeah, so there should, sorry, there should be, um, there should be a thing that says start, stop, continue. Have you done these things before? Blank faces. Okay, so uh, this is one of these kind of like feedback things, synthesis, you, uh, all three of you responded to the, the, some of the feedback on the online thing. If on that you can write down, um, I guess specifically for me, not the whole course, um, what you want me to start doing, one of the annoying things that you want me to stop doing, and something that you like about what I'm doing that you want me to continue. And if you could like tear those off and put them in a the box at the back, then that would be great. And then I might do something about improving the way I teach. Um, or not. Um, so I'll, I'll hopefully put this lecture, if I don't mess up the recording again, online on Learn. Have a look at some of the little videos on, um, in the videos folder. They should be useful. And I'll see some of you on Wednesday. That's almost in time. Wednesday, what? Well, there's. Uh, uh, I think the Tuesday practical is next week, and the Wednesday practical is this week. For reasons that are obvious only to me. I'm doing another practical this afternoon for some other course, so. Okay? Awesome!